Hey everybody, Thomas here. And today we're gonna to go over cutting hard logs and what I consider a hard log to cut on the sawmill. As you can see, I've got a pretty small log here in the mill right now. Someone's probably thinking, well, I thought a hard log to cut on the sawmill would be the largest log you can put on the sawmill. So if I put a 35, a 38 inch diameter hickory log on here that's 15 foot long, Yes, that would be quote unquote hard to cut on the sawmill because it's nearly maxing out all my limits on the sawmill. It's maxing out the limit on the weight. It's maxing out the limit on what my turner can turn. I'm maxing out close to my max width of cut and it's a hard species of wood to cut. But after many years of cutting everything, what I have found is oftentimes the hardest logs to cut are your small logs or your small logs that are unique and have say branch sections or crotch sections or something that's abnormal, or something that doesn't fit between your bunks or all your log stops. But oftentimes what I find out, especially in this field of work, where you're cutting for, say, say charcuterie boards, or for specialty, you know, live edge tables, the straight, plain Jane stuff, yes, it's beautiful wood and it has its purpose. But in the market that I like to focus on everything, the unique cuts of wood and the, the unique species, um, a lot of times they're either small, you, you get what you can uh, because you don't get a lot of it. It could be just unique stuff. So this is a perfect example right here. This black walnut log is about 10 inches in diameter here on the base. As you go up the length of it, it's about five foot long or so. As you go up the length, you have a crotch section up here. And you've got essentially a triple crotch. You've got a Y section here, but then you also have a Y section there as well. The way that I put this on here is the way that I believe I want to cut this log. You always want to see what's going to give me the most figure, what's going to give me the most unique cuts, the most beautiful cuts, whatever that may be. I could turn this log upright and cut the Y section like that. However, I would be losing a lot of this right here. And there might not be anything good in there because as you can see, or maybe you can't see, but there's a decent amount. There's about an inch and a half of sapwood, a little bit of heart here. But maybe, maybe the best cut would be something where if I had this lifted up right here, something, something. I want to maximize this section right here. I want to maximize this section right here because it has, this is where you had the most compounding of grain and the highest chance of getting beautiful figure because this right here has been under compression, under tension, under all sorts of stresses based on the limb formation on the wood. That's gonna give you the figure that, what I look for anyways. But needless to say, if I'm gonna cut this log, it's gonna be a non-typical way of cutting this. It's not gonna be uh, just, you know, throw it on the mill and you just slab it up like a normal, you know, stick of pine or something like that. So if I want to cut this properly and, and still maintain this crotch section here, well, I can't operate really on my log stops. I'm gonna have to really start using my log stops that are built in or lower here on the, on the actual uh, bunk itself. I'm limited on this sawmill and other sawmills by my carriage. My carriage travels about like that line right there. It doesn't go to the full width of the uh, frame there, but I know if I have any of this log extending over this line right here, the carriage will not pass. So again, pushed up against the bottom here, so see how she's butted up against there. I can't bring this section any further over. However, based on the length of the log, if I was to just saw it the way it is right now, this end is unsupported because of course it's not touching anything here. And if I wanted to keep it over there, and if I didn't want to add any spacer here, if I brought this over, it could actually make it, but I'm getting close to my limits. Okay, so now you can see a little bit better. Being close to the limits is okay. That's not a problem, but I like to give myself a little room to work with. If I continue cutting in this orientation where it is right now, continue slabbing it down until I cut no more, every time I lower this down below the halfway point of the log so 50 percent down this will keep on moving further and further over and at some point i want to be able to use this point and this point like we already have back here but if i continue to do that you see i have 
a couple inches there it's going to continue moving out that way and i'll be in an extremis right there so what i like to do if i wasn't going to make my first cuts there if i wanted if i had to say make a mantle or something the good thing is we have a sawmill we typically have a lot of debris and stuff off cuts just like this maple piece is right here uh, sitting around the sawmill so i'll go ahead and put this in here make sure it's kind of secured in there and you want something that is not going to be something you don't care about because sometimes this does become a sacrificial piece anyway so now i've got that pinned over and i've got the log and about the orientation i want it's secured all i have to do is bring in my uh my log dog there and dog her in so we'll go ahead and make this first few cuts. I need to bring, of course, my log stops down lower. The height that I like to cut, especially these smaller logs, you don't want to go less than 50% of the height. So something around the 50%, maybe 60% mark. If I was to have it up here, it would be okay, but I'm getting closer with the blade. I'll probably go right here, which I'm going to say is roughly 60%, or maybe even a here being 50%. If I go any lower down here, again, I've got more of the log above it. You have these diagonal pieces, which are, helps for turning certain logs and moving stuff around. But if you uh, go much lower, then you can actually have a, a overturning moment that happens on the log as you get pressure on your blade. You never want your log to be moving around. You want it to be secured when that blade's going through it. If it was to get into a situation where this log started to roll on me, it's going to kink your blade as such like that. And I recently saw that on one of the forum posts or on Facebook or something like that. Someone twisted up a log in their blade. It was a big, big, huge mess. All right, let's go ahead and get this thing pinned down. We'll make our first few cuts and then we'll see, uh, we'll make our reference cuts and then we'll go ahead and see what we can do on the other side. The other side, we won't have as much of an issue because nothing extends out beyond that side right there this one right here um based on the size i could make a small mantle but a mantle is like a one one log use i wouldn't get much else out of this what i'm really going to make this into is probably charcuterie boards that'd probably be the and maybe spoons and such like that i really want to maximize this piece right here and in fact since i think i want more of this crotch in a certain orientation, I'm going to come back and I'm going to put something underneath there to kind of hold this log about like that. Okay, so I was fortunate enough, I found a piece of red pine. So I'm going to go ahead and use this piece of red pine, put it right in there, bring it over, make sure I'm not, the kids crying or not. So I run into a little bit of issue there. I can't go quite there because I'll run into contact with that bearing. So I gotta move the log section down. Again, little log, logs are difficult. Just moving it down just a little bit. That's better right there. I clear my bearings. All's good. In fact, it's gonna get a little bit better when I pull this over. There we go. Okay log is nice and secured. I'm getting the plane that I like to cut right here. I'm going to lower down this log stop to essentially like right here and we'll put the blade through it. So I put on a time lapse. Make a... Do I need to put on a time lapse? Nah, we'll go ahead and cut it real quick.
one thing I'll say, especially on these little logs, and everyone's like, oh, you cut so much faster th through that. Yes, I could. However, not on these little logs, not on these little hard ones like this, because you might run into a crazy situation where you find yourself in a, in a bind or bend or something. You don't really want to do that. All right. So we do have a little bit of sapwood, a lot of sapwood, um, and some heartwood. That's fine. I cut that board at an inch and a quarter. Uh, I want to keep it a little bit thicker and everything to give myself some room to work with. Plus, it's an outside cut, not the greatest cut and everything. But I definitely can make something beautiful out of this. I don't know what as of yet. I have a lot of nothing but sapwood on that side. So we'll see what this one has. We'll come back to that one at a later date. Okay, so now we have our reference cut made. I always speak to the reference cut. The reference cut is always critical because every cut after that will be dependent upon how well you did this cut. So if I had this one at a weird angle, I would not have got all this beautiful uh, figure and stuff in there. Now I know you can't see it right now. We'll show that here later on uh, towards the end, but I've, I've got the correct orientation on this side. So as you flip it 180 over, you're going to continue on that same orientation from the backside down. It makes sense. So if you start with something good, you end with something good. If you start with something bad, you end with something bad unless you reorient your log. Let's go ahead and get this thing turned over. And because I cut, quote unquote, the worst side first, the side that stuck out the most and was the, the most difficult side to cut, and I have my reference cut done, I don't have to mess around with that anymore. I don't have to do any kind of crazy propping or anything like that. Once I take my log stops all the way down, I will make contact on these smaller uh, pinning points right here. Ta-da, it's almost a straight back there on that side. And now all we gotta do is we'll set the, uh, well the computer already set, we're at an inch and a quarter, we'll just go ahead and slab it all the way down. Very simple, and we're gonna maintain that beautiful crotch section in there, so can't wait to see what that looks like. I'm gonna go in and throw in a time lapse for real now, and we will show what the final product looks like, and hopefully this helps you out on cutting these weird little unique logs. Another thing that's difficult about these logs, since it doesn't go between three bunks, you need three bunks in order to use your log turner. Because it doesn't go between three bunks, I can't use my log turner, so you have to do some things manually with it by hand or with a cant hook. Another thing, if you have a weird log that kind of like arcs around, you need at least contact on two of your three, if it's that long, um, log stops or uh, pinpoints at the bottom. You might have a contact point here and there, and you might have a gap here in the center because it bows out. Or you, say you had a log that was straight here and they kind of bowed out that way, you need at least two points here. Preferably, you want these two to touch you definitely don't want those these two to touch you you got to have at least these two to touch or the outer most extreme ones because your pinpoint your your portion on here with your logs log dog if it's if you were pinned between these two right here this log dog right here would do nothing for you so you got to be between these two bunks here or this bunk and your third bunk with a goofy oblong log all right let's do the time lapse Okay, folks, as you can see, we got three really nice slabs. These are all inch and a quarter and everything, and I have two slabs off to the side here. Not the best quality, but I can still get maybe a charcuterie board or two, maybe three out of that one there. But I'm going to make those ones into spoons probably, or some kind of little smaller kitchen utensil type things. But these three slabs right here in the middle are gorgeous. We had a little bit of water. We went ahead and threw it on there. Um, but what I wanted to show was this right here. This is what why we were trying to get the crotch section, because we have all of this just absolutely beautiful figure right here in this crotch section. That is awesome. That is beautiful. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've taken a piece like this and made this into a really cool centerpiece. These are inch and a quarter, uh, decently wide and everything. But if I come here, I mean, heck, 
that's almost like a freaking guitar as it is right now. But if I came in here, if I like rounded out this section here, that'd be a really cool centerpiece on a table. I'd have two really good centerpieces. This one right here, I'll probably make a board out of this incorporating this beautiful figure right here because this is where that other crotch section was starting to grow out uh, of the top as like that triple crotch, if you will. Very happy where these turned out. But again, these boards right here, if I do things correctly, say if I made two centerpieces out of that right there, if I trim them up, get them nice and uh, you know unique looking, if you will, those might be able to sell for about 100 bucks each, just the top section. Then I could probably get two or three boards out of the bottom sections, say at like 35 bucks each, 30, 35 bucks each. And then you have this right here. So you're looking at a couple hundred dollars out of a branch of walnut that was essentially, you know, something that could have been turned into firewood. Not that big in, in general, but you, you can make a couple hundred bucks off of, off of something this small. And that's what I absolutely love about working these small little pieces. Because if you have a sawmill, you don't have to have a, a great big sawmill. You can have a, you know, a 1220, a Cook's MP32, a Woodmiser LX55, a LT15 start. There's all sorts of, or a Norwood uh, Woodland Mills. You, you know, the list goes on and on. You could have any one of those mills and cut this same log right here. But know that the smaller logs have a higher tendency to want to roll on you. They have a higher tendency, I and mean, they're just harder to pin down. Um, but again, they can have some really amazing grain in there. One of the things I like to do, I like to make charcuterie boards that have sapwood on top and bottom, and these are perfect. Because if I make, th these boards are easy. If I just cut here, and I cut uh, here, make that board about 15 inches long, I can run that through on my small DeWalt planter, no problem. But you have a two-tone board that's beautiful with these two knots here, that'll sell like freaking hotcakes. And I can probably get almost three out of each of these uh, below the crotch section. So that'll be another video sometime down the road. But again, I appreciate you staying tuned and watching this video. And hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. And we have many more videos coming up. One of the videos I'm going to talk about is what is inside of my lube tank up here. Fine folks at BioLube. I said, hey, you got a sticker sent to me. I'll throw it on there because I'm testing out BioLube right now. BioLube GP. This is a an additive that we can add instead of using diesel because the smell of diesel was getting a bit intense and with mr gary atkinson's uh, little felt pad design here and i added a little modification to it as you can see the blade and my guide rollers are staying clean as can be and my blade's not rusting up because it's being oiled but that's for another video please like subscribe and we'll see you around thanks